Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. And today we are going to take a look at FTA and what that was all about. Started around 2004. And uh, well, before FTA, the only way to hack the signal was to use provider equipment and cards. And then all of a sudden it was a watershed moment, a moment that changed everything as far as satellite hacking ever went. It was probably one of the biggest deals I've ever seen. Suddenly you didn't need the provider's equipment anymore. You could use these boxes here made by Pansat. Now Pansat was a legitimate company that made these for the free to air market. Uh, however, they got a little bit corrupted as things went on and we'll get into that too as money corrupts as they say. But how on earth did this even happen? Or how was it even possible? Well, it was to do with being DBB compliant. And uh, starting in 1995 was when the European Union set the DBB standards. And uh, 1996 Dish Network launches, and there's one of their receivers right there, the black one. Now, Dish decided that it would be good for business if their equipment was DVB compliant because that would allow them to sell their equipment to European providers. Was that a good, wise business decision? It might have been at the time, but guess what, guys? That also meant their equipment was also DVB compliant, were free to air receivers, and Free-to-air receivers also use the same set-top box chip, the STI series, the 5500. And uh, this board here is actually out of a Dish Network receiver. And if we go over here, this board here, this was the first purpose-built FTA receiver designed for piracy. It was called a Blackbird. This is all that's left of it is the motherboard. But look at the Omega chip in there. It is an STI 5518. That chip, uh, it's the same series. And uh, I'm gonna show you guys next, the next coming video I have for you. Watch this, guys. So what exactly is DVB? And what does it represent? You've probably seen this logo on certain satellite equipment and uh, especially FTA receivers. And you've also probably seen it on Dish Network's receivers. And here is the interesting story. The DVB standard was standardized in 1995. And uh, in 1996, Dish Network launched and they decided to be DVB compliant. And uh, what it actually represents, as it states here, it's a set of international open standards for digital television. DVB standards are maintained by the DVB Project, an international industry consortium, and it's published by the Joint Technical Committee of the European Telecommunication Standard Institute, the European Committee for Electro-Technical -Te Standardization, and the European Broadcast Union. So basically, it's European Union. If you want to sell your equipment or operate in Europe, you need to be DVB compliant. And uh, so let's go down and look at some of these standards here. There's so many of them, but all FTA receivers with the DVB logo and Dish Network's equipment comply to all of these standards. And the interesting one is the encryption. So we look at the encryption. It says the conditional access system, which is uh, the, the access card, uh, DVB CA uh, defines a common scrambling algorithm and the DVB CSA, a physical common interface, the DVB CI for accessing scrambled content. The DVB CA providers develop their own wholly proprietary conditional access system with reference to these specifications. So that would that would mean uh, a company like Nagravision would conform to these standards because they want their cards to work in a DVB compliant receiver. 
And here we have an early 2700 receiver made by Echo Star for Bell Express View. The same receiver was used by Dish Network. We'll go over and look at a Dish uh, unit and we'll zoom in on the front. And what do you see there? The DVB logo. So Dish was DVB compliant from the very beginning. And let's go over and look at the chip that is found inside that particular receiver, the STI 5500 Omega. There was a series of these chips. They were introduced in 1997, as it states here. And uh, if we scroll down here, the Blackbird, which I just showed you the motherboard from, uh, it was purpose built to basically be a pirate box for Dish Network. It is using the STI 5518. When we compare them, you can see the STI 5500 and the 18 are basically the same, but the 18 has twice the static RAM. And uh, yeah, more static RAM was always a good thing because you could then have more uh, running in memory. So, okay, let's uh, go over here now and let's take a look at uh, this confidential document on the STI 5500 DVB D scramblers. So again, it is a DVB compliant chip. This is the heart of the set top box. It runs pretty much everything. It's quite interesting to look at this. And uh, let's go down and uh, there's the pin out. And uh, right here, CAS, I'm not sure that's conditional access system one and zero. Are those smart card uh, serial inputs? I believe so. A little bit more down here. Let's see what else we got. <clears throat> Smart current interfaces right here in the flow chart. So, yep, input, output. That's bi directional and that's input, and there's all your output. So, yeah, anyways, uh, very interesting. Okay, guys, now that you have a better understanding of what DVB was all about and what it stands for, and a little bit about the Omega series of set-top box chips, the STI 5500 series, there it is there, the set-top box chip that runs it all. And this chip, yes, was DVB compliant, and why Dish Network decided to use it just made things simpler. However... The access card is simply a peripheral of the Omega. And in reality, the access card, it's not even needed. Throw it away. A virtual image of that card could actually be run in memory. And there is the ROM and there is the RAM. So an image could be loaded into RAM and run virtually. And that's exactly what happened. The first thing I actually saw was... a. Uh, a flash file for a 2700 receiver that was hacked a firmware I burned it into this receiver and sure enough this receiver ran without an access card opened all the channels it was just unbelievable seeing that was kind of like it was like a weird dream it was just it was surreal and uh, the next thing you knew somebody was making their own box and that was the Blackbird and uh, there it is there, and it had the Omega chip, and uh, if you look closely, there's the ROM chip, just like in a dish receiver, and there is the RAM and the Omega chip in the center. And this guy sold for about 300 bucks, and it opened all channels on Bell and Dish Network. It lasted for about a year. The providers were very much caught off guard by all of this. Um, there was no ECMs against FTA receivers for probably about a year. Uh, like I said, they were very much caught off guard, but they became very aggressive later on because it was suggested that Dish was very upset about this for other reasons. Um, even back in the card hacking days when you actually needed Dish receivers, um, they were still selling that hardware, which people were using to hack with, but they were still making money on the hardware. But when things went over to the FTA boxes, they weren't making anything anymore. And I think that was really 
Uh, yeah, that really pissed them off. So they got very legal about that, and they started going after a lot of companies like Pansat that were selling FTA receivers. And uh, more on that in a second, guys. Acapulco, Mexico, where we took 18 goddesses to have fun in the sun and participate in a wet t-shirt competition so wild, you might get wet. Don't miss the Hot Body Wet T-Shirt Challenge. All this month on pay-per-view. So the Pansat 2300 is the first legitimate free-to-air receiver that I know that was actually used for piracy. And uh, it was all because it contained an Omega chip, the STI 5518. And... Uh, also, it has a JTAG interface, as you can see, it was utilized there. Now, the Omega has on board uh, the diagnostic control unit for the JTAG, and uh, it's just similar to uh, the DISH network receivers. The process is exactly the same with these receivers. So another compatibility with the DISH network stuff. And, uh, you know, the J JTAG and JKeys was already figured out at this time. So all of this stuff lended itself to allowing an FTA receiver like this to be hacked for illegitimate purposes. And uh, so as time went on, Pansat kind of noticed that, hey, why are these 2300 receivers? We can't keep them in stock. People are buying them all up. They looked around and they figured it out. So, uh, well... They wanted to make things easy too with a purpose-built receiver. As, as I said before, money corrupts. They got into the game in a big way and I'm gonna to touch on that too. But uh, just wanted to point things out here. With the 2300 to flash a new bin to it, you either had to do it through a JTAG, which was a quick way of doing it, or you had to do it through the RS-232 on the back, which was the slow way of doing it. It took quite a while, I think it took about an hour. And once the providers caught on, they actually started to do ECMs against the virtual card that was running in memory. And uh, so you had to get a new bin, and you had to upload a new bin to keep things going. And uh, to make things easier, the uh, guys over at Pansat, now I had a connection over in Pansat because I had actually done, done some work for them early on. And this is the reason why I actually had this 2300 receiver I was testing for them die set commands that they were they were doing different firmwares uh, when this receiver first came out for motor control for rotating the SG2100 uh, motor that uh, was available on the market very early on for rotating your antenna. Um, I did field testing for them and gave them feedback and I had a connection in there which I stayed in contact with. and. Uh, the feedback I was getting about what was going on was quite interesting because they were well aware of what was going on here and they wanted a piece of the game and they got into it in a big way. As I said, money corrupts and they purposely built and designed this receiver here. Now, like I said, it was a, a difficult process for, you know, you had to be a bit tech savvy to either use a JTAG or the RS-232. You also had to remove the receiver from your shelf by your TV, take it over to your computer. Uh, that was, you know, difficult, time consuming. So Panset went out and built the, the 3500. Now this receiver lended itself to being hacked, okay? It had a uh, SD uh, card slot in there, which allowed you to easily, anybody could, you know, flash a bin to this thing and it was quick. You could be uh, up in a minute again, just, Download the file on a flashcard, stick it in there, go to your remote, push a button, and you're back up. New bin loaded. Uh, we can take a look inside this guy. And, uh, okay, the Omega, they put a heat sink on it because the Omega was now doing a bit more crypto. Uh, it's probably giving off a bit of heat, so to keep things cool and stable, they put a heat sink on there. They also added a card slot. I mean, that's not unusual as some receivers, uh, FDA receivers, do allow you to put a card in so you can subscribe to some programming. That is, again, a European thing, uh, European Union thing. So not unusual to see it. However, the fact that you can read cards uh, opens up the receiver to doing even more hacking in a lot of different ways, like card sharing. So 
why they put that card slot on there probably was a good idea they, they thought anyways pan slot well i'm going to show you this guy we're going to we're going to power it up it's still got a blacklist bin on it and uh we're going to hook it up and we will uh look at some fda programming legitimate fda programming i should say i'm ginger from american ecstasy when you see a scrambled picture on this channel, don't worry. We'll be testing the uncensored American Triple Ecstasy every night at 10 p.m. Eastern. It's so hot, we have to scramble. So now that you had your FTA receiver up and running and you were able to get both Bell and Dish and you needed to have a satellite antenna that was capable of receiving four different satellites because Bell had two satellite locations and Dish had two satellite locations that you wanted to go after. And uh, the way to do that, to keep things simple, was to get one of these oval antennas and uh, which had multi LMBs on it. Uh, what you would do is modify it in this sort of a, a way here and add an additional LMB on one side. Typically the one in the center here is uh that would be aimed at say 101 then you would have 110 119 and over here you would have 91 and 82 which were uh, the bell satellites and uh you would run uh, the cables from all of those l and b's into these things called dissect switches which uh these are four-way switches four satellites and this is the output here single cable coming down to your receiver and in the menu you would set uh for each satellite one two three and four the dissect uh selection and uh yeah basically the receiver would send a signal to the switch and you had the choice of four different lmbs and that's how that worked kept things simple for a lot of people now there were some additional satellites and some people got even fancier there were eight-way switches and you could tune in all kinds of other things uh, on different satellites. Some people went with KU band dishes, 30 inch dishes for fixed satellite services and blended in other things too. Um, it was an FTA receiver, so you could actually use it for legit FTA as well, blended in with uh, your, you know, your pirated stuff. So that's how that worked. It was, uh, it was a pretty amazing time to be able to do this. So uh, yeah. So if you're watching me, you're a satellite pirate. So as I stated earlier, I truly believe that the Pansat 3500 was purposely designed and built to enable piracy, mainly because of the card slot through the front that allowed you to uh, flash a new bin file or firmware to the receiver. Under normal circumstances with an FDA receiver, you would never uh, ever be updating the firmware on your receiver. There would really be no need to. So the fact that this enabled that and allowed you to do that easily shows what it was all really about. Now, Pansat took things to a whole new level. They weren't just enabling you to be able to flash a bin. They were also providing the bins, but they were doing it on the underground. They hired hackers to create bins for their receivers. And uh, there was a hacker known as Blacklist online. And whenever, whenever the Pansat receivers would go down, everybody was waiting on Blacklist to release another bin. Well, Blacklist actually worked for Pansat. It was a conspiracy. It got found out. And uh, Dish Network and Nagrastar launched a massive lawsuit against Pansat. And uh, they won that lawsuit. And Pansat was ordered to pay uh, Dish Network and Nagra $121 million. And um, they were also barred from shipping any of their equipment into the United States. Permanent injunction bans FTA distrib distributor from trafficking, okay, which pretty much killed Pansat. And uh, to me, that was kind of sad because Pansat in the beginning was a legitimate company and uh, made some really good products that are sadly missed. So as they say, money corrupts and they went after the money and they thought they were safe, I guess, over in South Korea but they weren't, and uh, that uh, spelled their own doom.
So unfortunately, that's how it was. Anyways, we're going to fire this guy up right now. We're going to connect him to a TV. And we're going to uh, connect him actually to a satellite antenna. We're going to do a scan. And it's just going to be kind of cool to see this receiver working after such a long time. Okay, guys, stick around. That's coming up next. Okay, guys, I got the Pansat 3500 here all set up. In the back here, I have it connected to a satellite outside antenna, which is aimed at 97 degrees KU band, which is Galaxy 19. And this little box here is a cute little uh, accessory. It was a UHF remote. Uh, worked on any Pansat receiver, just plugged in the back. So I'm using one of those because the original remote I don't have any more. Now this is connected up to my monitor here and of course we have no signal. So we're going to go down here and we are going to plug that in and we should see the Pansat here powering up momentarily. There we go. See the V80. You guys that had these receivers probably remember what that stood for and uh okay we have no signal obviously as it is not configured properly now i will get the remote for that pansat uhf remote and push now you guys will probably remember the x05 bl stood for blacklist Last time it was updated was August the 2nd in 2008. That was probably the end of the uh, FTA era. It lasted a few years, but yeah, 2008 was probably the end of it all. And uh, we go into the installation menu and remember the password was always 0000, zero, zero, zero on these things. And uh, antenna set up. Let's go in there. I don't really care what satellite I'm on, but I do need 10750, which is the LMB frequency. So that actually looks good. Let's um, exit that. And let's do a blind scan. Okay, let's start that scan. <clears throat> should pick up something oh yeah look at that see we're getting something there it's picking up something it's found a transponder very cool so as this scans I am going to read you Pansat was not the only uh, FT FTA uh, manufacturer. When things really started to heat up and everybody wanted an FTA receiver to hack with, it was unbelievable the amount of companies that started to show up out of the woodwork and manufacturers that were making FTA receivers that lended themselves to being hacked. And uh, here's just uh, some of the names I found online. Uh, Buzzsat, Blue Jay, Blackbird, Diamond, Digiwave, Ebox, Extreme View, Fortech, Homesat, Icon, Envision, VisionSat, AuraSat, Pansat, of course, who we know, Skyview, Scat Pros, Setopia, uh, CSAT, Smartbox, Sat Cruiser, SuperSat, TestSat, Space Star, Captain, Captive Works, CoolSat, DreamLink, FreeSat, LimeSat, NanoSat, NeoSat, ProSat, ViewSat, and SonicView. Those are only some. I'm sure there was more. But, uh, yeah. All of those guys got in the game, and some of them also were also sued by, um, by Dish Network, Nagarstar. But Pansat was the one that I know that was sued uh, the, the most... 121 million dollars so anyways guys this is probably going to take a while i'm just going to stop it and i'll come right back when it is done okay it's finished doing its transponder scan and uh now it's scanning for channels saving please wait looks like it's done yeah hey wow we got some tv going here now this is legitimate free-to-air, and this is what these receivers were originally designed to do. 
This is fr totally free programming that you can receive off of the satellite. Let me just exit here and there we go. Let's see channel list here. So Nat, like I was saying, if you're a guy from Thailand, I believe this is a Thai channel. So how do I do this? Yeah. How do I turn up the volume here? There we go. We can learn Thai. Okay, channel list, I'll go back. Good idea. So lots of channels up there, free to air, legitimate, free to air. Let's see what this one's about. متخصصين في نشر الوعي حول أهمية الحياة الرقمية الآمنة بين زملائهم في المدارس حيث جاء هذا البرنامج بالتعاون مع عدد من المؤسسات كل so lots and lots of channels that you can still pick up. Let's check out Libya. This is what's on TV in Libya right now. <laughs> The uh, favorite uh, Libyan soap opera of the day. So we're going to channel list here and see what else. So, like I said, this is legitimate FTA, and this is what these receivers were uh, intended to do originally, was to pick up stuff like this. Oh, there's a German channel. Let's go check that out. Okay, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's installment on the history of hacking satellite FTA. And stick around for my next video, which will be on IKS card sharing and these dream boxes, how, how it was done back in the day too. Uh, really cool how these things worked. You could put a card in here and share it across a network to other dream boxes, which could be in your house or in another country. Really cool. We're going to dive into that next uh, in the next installment, which is coming up soon. So look out for that. I'm also going to look at Infusion, which was really popular, and their Nova and the Sun server and all that other stuff, which you guys probably remember. This was an era that followed the FTA era. And uh, basically, you didn't have to maintain the receivers anymore. They did it on their end thanks to the internet connection. Okay, guys, have a good one. Uh, they observed uh, what they appear to be as uh, uh, telecommunications being intercepted and being uh, taken uh, via uh, the internet. In other words, the police noticed that the family's home entertainment system was set up to illegally pull in satellite television programs. The theft of telecommunication services was just the tip of the iceberg. Police seized 17 satellite receivers, two receiver dishes, 30 digital access cards, and a computer system used to rewrite receiver cards.